Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to talk about how the engine found in the new G80 M3 has been proven to make well over a thousand horsepower on a stock bottom end. So if you're new to my channel, this is my 2021 G80 M3 competition. It's currently in break-in mode. It's been taking quite a while to get to 1200 miles because I'm not really just trying to jump on the highway and keep the engine at a steady RPM. I'm just trying to do mixed driving to give it a good chance of a nice break-in. So this is the new S58 that you'll find in the M3 and M4 as well as the X3M competition. So what's really exciting about this engine is the fact that it hit 1050 horsepower without being stressed out at all. It was actually hitting 1050 crank horsepower back to back with perfect data logging and no signs of overheating or even being mildly stressed out. The reason it was tuned for that is because it's gonna be used in a drift car. I'm gonna to link to a video in the description about this engine for the Red Bull Drift Brothers. They're working with a company in Ireland called TDP, a guy named Robbie. It's a really interesting video where they talk about everything they did to make this engine reach 1,050 horsepower uh, designed for drift cars. So it's gonna be just back-to-back -back events nonstop. They expect it to last indefinitely at that uh, horsepower level on a stock bottom end. They were trying to tune for longevity and for back-to-back -back reliability so they can go out on drift events and do a two minute cool down and a two minute run back to back to back. So they ran out of steam on the factory turbos at 750 crank. That was just where the data logger would indicate some stress and excess heat but up to 750 crank, they could handle that all day long, back to back if that was their power level, but it wasn't. Over here, they had to add port injection to supplement because they did get to around 800 crank horsepower from what I understood on the stock fuel system and they needed to supplement uh, for cooling, etc., with port injection. So from what I understand, they worked with the M division to figure out where they would have to take material off the cylinder head to change the geometry slightly for a better area under the curve. It could have technically hit the power level with just higher PSI and giving you a, a peak horsepower on your dyno graph, but really they were going for a really broad torque curve and for area under the curve. So they slightly modified the cylinder head by consulting with BMW M to figure out where they could take material off without affecting anything. Slight modifications to the cylinder head. I think that would indicate that if you just want to upgrade your turbos with this motor and push it to the point where it's making good power without being stressed, you'll probably be able to get close to a thousand. But what's really exciting about that is they did that on the stock bottom end, stock pistons, stock rod, stock everything. So this engine is obviously super strong from the factory. The original pistons are making over a thousand crank, but I think that's for a very specific reason. And that's going to be the topic of this video today. I'm going to get very technical, but I'd like for you guys to understand the advances in technologies as of late and how this motor is doing something really different than the rest. Why I'm very excited about this topic is the fact that they did that on 91 octane, the equivalent of 91 octane, which is 95 Ron. Imagine that making a thousand crank on just pump gas. When my channel was a little bit smaller, I covered the topic of switching to ethanol uh, if you're running high boost and you wanna really push the limit. So we're gonna kind of briefly summarize that here and kind of explain why I think the engine in this car is so different than any other engine that's being made with regards to how it can get to big power on 93 octane. And we'll have to get into the theory of compression ratios, but I think you guys may find it interesting. This is an ethanol tester. So to start with, I wanna do a little demonstration between 93 octane and ethanol and show you the difference. I'm filling up this ethanol tester to right about here with water. I have some E85 here. So I made a bit of a mess with that, but that'll evaporate really quickly. So I gotta take this now and fill it up to the point where it's filled up right to the top of this arrow. So now I'm gonna give this a shake and we will see where this ends up. So this ethanol content's probably a little over 70 and change. It's not true E85, but uh, it's fine because I have a ethanol sensor in my car that would compensate. But regardless, this is mostly ethanol and we can prove something with it. So it's a little bit of a crude way to do it, but I'm gonna bring over just about uh, a straw's worth of fuel. So we'll put it right here. We'll light it up. So we pay attention to how aggressively that burns and the type of smoke that's coming off of it and how it's kind of uncontrolled. It just kind of all goes off at once. Hopefully it goes without saying, but please don't repeat any of this at home. That is how much soot was inside the fuel. Doing the same thing with E85. Have about just the same size and amount of fuel. 
pay attention to how that burns. It doesn't seem to go off all at once. It burns a little bit whiter, runs out of steam a little bit quicker, uh, and burns cleaner. So ethanol is a more controlled burn, I guess you could say, but you need more of it to do the same amount of work. It's a good way to get around uh, avoiding knock and pre-ignition. Most importantly, there's basically nothing on the paper towel after doing that. In my opinion, being able to achieve over a thousand crank horsepower on just 93 octane on a three liter straight six is almost unheard of, but there's reasons why it's possible and I wanna get into them in this video. So to start with, the compression ratio on this S58 engine is lower than it has been on any other direct injection turbocharged car that I've found on the market. It comes in at 9.3 to one. So we'll have to go into a little bit of a history lesson here, but we can use BMW engines to make the point. This is an N54 found in a 335i and a lot of E-series cars. It's directed injected as well as turbocharged. And in my opinion, what made this unreliable wasn't the switch to turbocharger technology. There wasn't much that would go wrong with them besides a little bit of wastegate rattle and premature wear. What was going wrong with these guys is the fueling. And it was because it was direct injected and it was new. There's an equivalent version of this engine overseas in Europe called the N53. And the N53 has a compression ratio of 12 to one, believe it or not, and it's direct injected. But funny enough, it doesn't make uh, much more power than the N52, which is port injected. I believe the reason for that is the fact that it has a standard camshaft on the intake. It doesn't have variable intake valve lift or valve tronic. So you can't really fine tune in that respect. So one of the byproducts of running direct injection is the fact that you can run a little bit higher compression ratio so that you can extract more power of the engine, compress more air to ignite with the fuel. Uh, it's not necessarily the reason you go for direct injection, you go for direct injection for emissions as well, but primarily the benefit of going to DI or direct injection is you can run a higher compression ratio. So here's a quick look at my disassembled N54 engine. You can see inside the cylinders and whatnot, uh, but to make the demonstration, I'd like to show you guys, we're gonna do it a different way. Let's assume that these are the cylinders, but upside down, and this is the top of the engine. I'm gonna insert this piston inside. So basically the difference between a high compression engine and a lower compression engine is how far down the piston can go. So if this was a top of the piston travel on one motor and that was the other, then that would have a higher compression ratio than this. It can compress more air than this can because by the time it's trying to go any further, the crankshaft would already be pulling it back down. You would expect that maybe the stroke would vary the compression ratio, that's very rare that that would change a lot, maybe by three or four millimeters. The main way compression ratio is modified is via the piston. On a naturally aspirated engine, the piston is likely to be flat on top, and on a turbo engine, it's likely to be dished like this to lower the compression ratio. But at the end of the day, they can't have it be completely like that because then there'll be nowhere where it starts and where there'll be some strength where the rings are. So if you're gonna lose a piston, uh, by running too much timing or pushing things too far, you're likely to crack a ring land and detonation is likely to occur on the outer edge here or maybe where the valve reliefs are, etc. because those are sharp points that they can get hot first. So like I said, the N54 has a compression ratio of 10.2 to one, even though it's turbocharged. The S58 is turbocharged as well, twin turbocharged, but it has a compression ratio of 9.3 to one, very low. If this was an N52 powered car, it would have a compression ratio of 10.7 to one, but it wouldn't have direct injection, it would have port injection. Going any higher than that, you may run out of fuel, you may not be able to get by with 91 octane. You would need a higher octane level, depending on the way the engine is designed. But then there was the N53, which wasn't offered in North America. It looked just like this, but it had different uh, composition of a block. It looked the same, but it was a different material. Um, it had high compression pistons inside of it so it can benefit from the DI. From what I can see, they get a few mi miles per gallon higher on the highway, like up in the 40s in Europe versus uh, mid 30s or high 30s. So they did it for fuel economy, almost like an experiment. They didn't really push things as far as they could have. So they were kind of experimenting with DI on some variants and they were experimenting with valve tronic on others and they were getting the similar power levels. What they never did was do a DI naturally aspirated version of their engine. So basically take an N53 block, put the N55 head on it, go with a shim over bucket, 
adjustable valves, individual throttle bodies, 12.5 compression, and make 400 and change crank horsepower. Um, that was theoretically possible at the time that they were coming out with the S55, but you know, things were changing and people were more interested in torque down low. So twin turbos was the way they went on the S55. So I believe there could have been a spiritual successor to the S54 found in the E46 M3 if they really wanted to, they could have went that route. But considering they already had the V8 in the E90 chassis, moving to a straight six NA probably would have disappointed a lot of people, but they still could have made some big power with the way technology had gone. But regardless, we ended up with twin turbos. And I believe they did that to impress the people that had the old V8 with the fact that the new S55 had more torque to the turbos. So the compression ratio is gonna dictate what type of fuel you should run. So now if this was a diesel engine, what would happen is the piston would go all the way to the point where it compresses the fuel so much that the friction of the air molecules will spontaneously ignite and push the piston back down and start the process. If it's super cold out, you may need a glow plug to start that, but otherwise there's no spark plug. It just compresses and compresses until the point where the fuel is so densely mixed that it goes off by itself due to compression. So there's an upper limit with regards to how much compression you can push on an NA naturally aspirated port injected car. You can only push about 11.5 to one maximum. That was found on the E46 M3, the S54 that revved to 8,000 RPM and made 330 horsepower. That was the absolute limit on 91 octane. If you're to go any higher, you're gonna detonate and have issues because you're gonna have the diesel effect as the pistons compressing everything and trying to maximize how much air can be involved in the burn. It will go off before the spark plug and break your engine. So you're limited. You can't go any further than that. That's about as far as you'll ever see for a naturally aspirated port injected car. But if they made an equivalent uh, direct injected any version of that car, then maybe they could have pushed it to 12.5 to one, or maybe even 12 to one, and you could have extracted more power out of it. But like the Integra Type R, any high performance version of an NA motor uh, has never really gone beyond 11. But nowadays you would expect to see over 12, uh, actually 12.5, 12.7 on like a Lamborghini V10. Kind of goes to show that you're limited with regards to how much compression you can push before you're gonna have problems. On the V10 and the Lamborghini, it actually has such a high compression ratio that they have to use both port injection and direct injection depending on the situation that's going on. So hopefully you guys get that. As you compress too much, you get the diesel effect and before it could burn the fuel with the spark plug, it goes off by itself at an uncontrolled time and it causes the engine to break or go under a lot of strain or high pressures, breaks the ring land and causes damage. What I found super interesting about the S58 is the fact that it has a low compression ratio. So just picture that it doesn't even go this far down. You're just jamming in air via the turbochargers and you're not overly compressing the air fuel mixture. Therefore, it's less volatile and less likely to have a dieseling effect. So you can make more power. You just got to run more boost. As you guys know, the S58 found in the G80 M3 competition already has a lot of boost from the factory. It runs 25 PSI, but these guys got to 45 PSI and the motor was not stressed out and they still did it on like the equivalent of 91 octane, which is just kind of crazy. So what I think the sweet spot would be for these cars is around 750 wheel on just 93 and you can beat on it all day long on just like a set of stage one turbos. It's gonna be really awesome when you can do that back to back and basically never have to worry about this engine even being remotely stressed. The 2JZ is considered legendary, but did you know that it had an 8.5 compression ratio? It was so low that off boost drivability was really bad and it had a lot of leg because it's just not gonna do nothing with that until the boost kicks in. So you get more of a, a, a drama or more of an event as it waits for that. But a direct injected car with small turbos feels like it has zero leg because it, even as it's running NA and not using boost, it still has good compression and can make good power. So if you're to dial that back, you'll lose some of the down low torque and drivability at the expense of getting more power up top. If you really wanted the N54 to compete with the 2JZ, you'd have to close the block, you'd have to close the deck, which people can do, there's kits you can buy. You could lower the compression ratio all the way down to like eight and a half to one. You could ditch the direct injection and go strictly to port injection. And you could put a massive turbo right here and make a thousand crank horsepower all day long to the point where um, it's gonna be legendary. 
but it's old school to do that. Would you really want to be stepping that far back in time, dropping the compression ratio all the way down to the eights just to be able to make big power without blowing up? That's almost like cheating. But did you know that the new 765 LT McLaren engine is doing just that? They have compression ratios at like eight, seven, and they run really high boost and they run port injection. So they're kind of stuck in the 90s in that respect with regards to the technology that they're doing. But of course, it's an amazing car and they make it all work. So I'm pretty sure that the engine in the new G80 M3 is going to go down in history as one of the best straight sixes of all time, surpassing the 2JZ because it can just make so much power without being stressed out due to the lower compression, but also meeting all the new emission standards. As I've talked about in previous videos, this car has dual HPFP high pressure fuel pumps that run at 350 bar instead of 200 bar in the older generation cars. And I believe that was a trick up their sleeve with regards to how they met emissions even at lower compression due to better atomization. So this is a direct injection head and you'll notice there's a hole for where the injector would poke through to inject directly into the combustion chamber. And it was argued that that's not necessarily better for atomization because you're contending with the pressures inside the combustion chamber. But I believe with the new super high 350 bar fuel pressure, they're kind of doing that as well, helping with atomization. And primarily the main benefit of direct injection is you can inject it into the combustion chamber at the exact moment that you want it to fire. In contrast to having the fuel coming in through the intake port and down in. Some of it would arrive earlier than the rest of it and the burning may not be consistent. You may have a lean condition as it's trying to all enter in. You have to dial back on when the piston can fire so you don't have that event. Dialing back on when the cylinder would fire would be instead of uh, igniting the spark plug right at this point, you would ignite it a little bit earlier on and that would be considered retarding the timing. So as it's on its way up, it will do it before top dead center so many degrees, but then if you were to be having issues, then it will do it a little bit earlier. Just for fun and for some added extra content, picture that this was a, a inline six, but it had a big carburetor on the side. It was old school single barrel. Then imagine the timing from when the jets are injecting fuel into the intake manifold to spread it out to all the individual cylinders and imagine how safe you'd have to be on timing to not have it go off at the wrong time because it's got to travel down a tube and all the way in to make it into the the combustion chamber before it can fire that's just kind of crazy to think but they had to do that then they went to dual barrel and four barrel carbs and they had one tube feed one section of the engine and all that kind of stuff and eventually got the throttle body injection and then you had port injection where you're firing on each piston at the right time, but you're not getting it right in the combustion chamber, you're getting it behind the intake valve. So you gotta chill out with your timing because you can have detonation and have issues. But if you really wanna extract the most, you can have the piston come all the way to the top. You can have the, the firing of fuel at the exact moment you want it. And you can get the most power out of that given volume of air and fuel without worrying about it because you can control the timing. You, you won't have it go off on the wrong time. I apologize for the lack of interesting visuals in this video. It was all really just theory, but I figured uh, let's take a look at this car while I talk. I'm excited for the fact that this car can make a thousand crank horsepower, sure, but not really for me. That's not why it's exciting. What's exciting about it is the fact that it did it on, you know, less than 93 octane. You know, running ethanol is a good band-aid solution if your car is not really designed to run such high boost given its compression ratio. If it was more geared toward being like a NA or regular driver. So it's just interesting, in my opinion, to see a car like this come out with an engine that's so different with a low compression ratio with direct injection. And the fact that if you just want to keep your stock turbos and run 750 crank horsepower all day long, you're definitely not going to need to run ethanol. And if you want to run a set of upgraded stage one turbos, you'll probably be able to stick with your stock fueling and make, you know, maybe 800 real horsepower which is just pretty cool for the last hurrah of the all internal combustion engine without any mild hybrid technology, etc. In my next video, I'll probably try to get some more content going on the 335i and then we'll be done the break-in on this car relatively soon. So if this is the first video you're catching of mine, please consider subscribing. I do upload regularly. And if you liked it, please give it a like to help me rank a little bit higher. Thanks for watching. <laughs>